All right. Well, welcome everyone. This is Rob Ross, the Executive Director of NC Live. And I think we are just about to get started. I want to give folks time to funnel in. I know I had a Zoom update this morning, so I'm probably not alone in that regard. So um, maybe I'll just give it a few more seconds and then we'll begin. All right, I think it's that time. So let's go ahead and get started. Um, I am pleased today to welcome uh, Meredith Farkas as our keynote speaker for the 2024 virtual conference. Meredith is a faculty librarian at Portland Community College in Oregon, a perpetual beginner and a recovering workaholic. From 2007 to 2021, she wrote the In Practice column for American Libraries focusing on accessible technologies, collaboration, values-driven work, anti-racism, and reflective practice. She has also authored the blog Information Wants to be Free since 2004. Meredith has been in many different leadership and management roles throughout her career, but her favorite role is working with students and faculty as an instruction librarian. We're so pleased to have her here today. Please welcome Meredith Farkas. Hi. Thank you so much to Rob and Sophie and everyone at NC Live for inviting me. And thanks everyone for being here. Before I get started, um, I just wanted to let you know that there is a long bibliography of works that influenced this talk at the end of my slides. So you don't have to worry about jotting down any of the specific books, articles, or authors I mentioned. They're all there. And um, I'm going to read out every quote that I share on the screen so you don't have to worry about reading while I'm talking. Um, the link to my slides is right here, and it will also be posted on my last slide when I take questions. So it is um, slow time, friends. Let's just sit back and relax. Um, don't try to multitask. Let's be here together in this moment. So for most of us, the past four years showed us that our carefully built lives were kind of built atop Jenga sets and removing a single piece could send the whole thing toppling. The support that you assume you'll get from the social safety net or your community often isn't there. As Margaret Thatcher said, there is no society, only individuals. And I think the most frustrating part is recognizing that this is how the system was designed to work. It isn't really a bug, it's more of a feature of our social fabric. In a culture focused on individualism and chasing individual achievement, focused on people constantly proving their worth, on collecting accolades, in a culture that reifies hustle and that good old Horatio Alger myth of pulling yourself up by your bootstraps, everything you do is a referendum on your worth. We live in a phony meritocracy. Success is seen as self-created, even when a person starts off life at third base with all of the resources and connections one could hope for. And anything other than success is seen as a sign of personal weakness, even when it's caused by things completely beyond our control. Why have a social safety net when a society is predicated on the assumption that anyone can be successful if they just work hard enough? And if you're not a success, if you struggle, well, obviously that's your fault. You didn't work hard enough. You weren't positive enough. You didn't manifest. I'll admit that for a long time, I bought into the idea that um, success and fulfillment were within my reach if only I just worked hard enough and proved myself. But I found that the reward for my grinding was usually burnout and more work. What I'm going to talk about today is the insidious ways that individualism and achievement culture erode our well being and our sense of the common good, and also to propose an alternative. That alternative is slow librarianship. Um, I really believe that slow librarianship could be the path toward healthier workplaces and healthier workers. But first, let me tell you a little bit about myself and my own positionality. My pronouns are she, her. I've been a librarian at Portland Community College for about 10 years, and I love the work I do. 
Prior to that, I was the head of library instruction at a large public urban research university, and before that at a small rural private university in Vermont. I've been writing the blog Information Wants to be Free since 2004. And in my previous career, I was actually a clinical social worker um, doing child and family therapy with mostly BIPOC families in South Florida. I'm a proud union member. I am a white settler living on occupied land of the Clackamas Chinook and Tualatin Kalapuya. I'm a Jewish woman whose father's family escaped systematic murder in Ukraine as refugees to the U.S. And I'm the daughter of an immigrant mother. I was born into significant privilege um, by virtue of the color of my skin and being middle class. I think it's helpful to remember that each of us has a unique collection of identities, privileges, and challenges that shape us. I've been so lucky in my career to work with terrific people who offered me encouragement and support through my work both in my libraries and within the larger profession, I've received more individual recognition than anyone really deserves, especially knowing that I always stood on the shoulders of giants. To the outside, it probably looked like I had it all, like my life was somehow aspirational. But like most people, what's visible is only part of the story. On the inside, I was the same messy, broken person I'd always been. The trauma, anxiety, and depression that I've dealt with since childhood really left me forever searching for external validation to feel worthy. And none of those accomplishments made me feel like I was enough. After 20 years of suffering from debilitating migraines, I finally accepted them as a disability and went through the um, really dehumanizing ADA accommodation process at work. Since then, I've also been diagnosed with an autoimmune connective tissue disease that, among other things, causes chronic pain. I'm also a recovering work addict. For the longest time, I saw that as a good work ethic, you know, just what I should be doing. And I received a lot of positive recognition for my work ethic, which only kind of fuels the addiction. The host of the Harvard Business Review podcast, The Anxious Overachiever, said in one episode that, Work addiction is a socially acceptable addiction. You get a lot of reward and external validation. And I think it can lull you into this sense that you're doing the right thing while you're killing yourself with work to avoid dealing with the pain and trauma that that addiction is masking. And I think work addiction and the encouragement of work addiction is very much fostered and encouraged by our capitalist achievement culture. For me, it wasn't until I rejected achievement culture that I was able to prioritize wellness in my own life. So what is achievement culture? It has a lot of dimensions, but in the workplace, you see it as an organizational culture really focused on achieving wins and accolades that are very visible to external stakeholders. It's also focused on maximizing worker productivity. Since the Industrial Revolution, um, the most common measure of organizational success has been productivity. And it's long been believed that being more productive will make individuals and organizations more successful, but most people don't even question it. It often becomes more about staying busy and doing new things than it is about making sure we're doing our best and most meaningful work. Achievement culture also gets into the personal sphere as well with the focus on self-optimization and becoming the very best version of yourself, which is nearly always predicated on um, external norms. And all of this is based on the myth of the merit meritocracy that anyone can achieve great things and that we absolutely deserve all the success we have. Achievement culture is also a culture of more. If we're not doing more and new things, we're seen as failures. And there's no ceiling to it. I've never worked at a library where management actually told us we were doing enough or even had a sense of what enough would look like. And the idea of pairing back, of focusing on just what is most valuable to our patrons is never considered, even though doing a lot doesn't necessarily mean that the library is doing the right things. 
I think another less acknowledged aspect of achievement culture is the encouragement of individualism and competition through the manufacturing of scarcity. Um, I was really inspired by Julia Glassman's 2017 article, The Innovation Fetish and Slow Librarianship, where she wrote about how achievement culture has led to serious competition amongst her colleagues. Since the members of each peer review cohort are judged against each other, and it's been made clear that only a select few can ever earn the coveted marker of exceptional performance, the process has become an arms race of the biggest, most impressive accomplishments librarians can showcase. How do you play up the fact that you're a talented and beloved teacher when you have a colleague who just overhauled the entire information literacy curriculum for their subject area and deployed a brand new series of online instructional modules. Sure, that approach may not have been appropriate for the departments with which you liaise, but think about how those two stories look side by side. There's intense pressure to constantly innovate, to throw out the old and invent something new. Now I'm sure the intent of this reward system was not to create this sort of toxic competition, but it's all too common that when you introduce a sense of scarcity, workers suddenly see their colleagues as competitors rather than collaborators. And where the focus becomes much more on being innovative than best meeting the needs of the people they're trying to serve. For those of us who have accepted the idea of meritocracy and embraced achievement culture in our work, we frequently discover that as we rack up achievements, we don't really find ourselves feeling better in any real way. Long before he ran for mayor or president, um, Andrew Yang wrote this great piece on achievement culture. In his book, Excellent Sheep, William Duresowitz describes the current generation of strivers as driven to achieve without knowing why. And then they become paralyzed when they're not sure how to proceed. I jokingly call the hangups associated with a drive to achieve as the achievement demons. When I was growing up, I'd study for days trying to get good grades. When I'd get an A, I'd feel elation for about 30 seconds and then a feeling of emptiness. Rinse and repeat. Yang's own career illustrates how hard it is to resist our programming, but research shows time and again that the reward for high achievers is usually more work. It's a never ending treadmill of striving. So why do we keep running on the achievement culture treadmill when we never reach that place where we feel satisfied? I think it's because of persistent messages in our lives that we're not enough. Women and people who've experienced trauma or oppression or racism are particularly vulnerable to these messages but our whole economy is designed around con convincing people that they're not enough as they are. And along with these persistent messages about our worth is of course the meritocratic promise that if we do more, achieve more, or buy more, we'll somehow be made whole. So you can't enjoy the present because you're always striving toward another goal. And you believe that once you reach that thing, your life will be better. But after that, there's another project and another goal and another, and another, and the goalposts keep moving, but you keep running on that treadmill, believing that a time will come when you'll feel whole and fulfilled. But if you're looking for fulfillment through external validation, you're never going to find it. And yet your job and perhaps others in your life will happily capitalize on your never ending need to please. And really, our society has created this culture of individual achievement and external validation seeking by convincing us that we live in a meritocracy. The move towards greater and greater embrace of neoliberalism since the 70s has convinced most Americans that people living in poverty are responsible for their own situation. The myth of the meritocracy makes us focus on our own individual achievement and the culture of scarcity pushes us to do it at the expense of others. The famous management consultant W. Edwards Deming argued in his book, Out of the Crisis, that 94% of most problems and possibilities for improvement belong to the system, not the individual. Yet so many problems in libraries and society are blamed on individuals. In his brilliant book, The Tyranny of Merit, What's Become of the Common Good, Michael Sandel writes about how these ideas came directly from Protestantism. 
The Protestant work ethic then not only gives rise to the spirit of capitalism, it also promotes an ethic of self-help and of responsibility for one's fate, congenial to meritocratic ways of thinking. This ethic unleashed a torrent of anxious, energetic striving that generates great wealth, but at the same time reveals the dark side of responsibility and self-making. This culture also gave us petty hierarchies in the workplace, professional versus paraprofessional, faculty versus staff, full-time versus part-time. These divisions make us jealously guard the minuscule privilege our roles give us instead of seeing ourselves in solidarity with all labor. In her article, Why Office Workers Didn't Unionize, Anne Helen Peterson wrote about how white collar workers largely didn't unionize in the 50s and 60s because one, they wanted to see themselves as having a status above blue collar workers, and two, they were socialized by their places of work to jealously guard the minimal privilege they had over their colleagues. I often think of this as the um, Dwight Schrute mentality. For those who haven't watched the show The Office, Dwight is a power-hungry paper salesman who is given the meaningless title of assistant to the regional manager by his boss, but always calls himself the assistant regional manager. He saw his colleagues as competitors and was single-mindedly focused on getting ahead. So the achievement culture that Julia Glassman described created a terrible environment of competition. But what's more, it isolated people from each other. Capitalism wants workers to compete with one another. They want to create those phony hierarchies. These are structures that keep us from uniting to advocate for justice and better working conditions for all of us because we fear losing the advantages and privilege we might have. And if we're isolated and alone, it will make us feel vulnerable. It will make us grind harder. It will make us focus on achieving things rather than building relationships, which when you really think about it, relationships are the true heart of our work as librarians. And when we treat relationships as transactional, just a means to an end, we never build the deep connections that are required for truly knowing and supporting and being part of our community. And all of this is at the heart of toxic work environments where people view their colleagues as threats or competitors instead of rightly turning their attention toward the people who are responsible for the culture. In toxic work environments, um, difference is treated as especially threatening, whether that's a passionate new librarian with big ideas or a BIPOC library worker. Katrina Davis Kendrick has documented toxic work environments in her research on both academic and public libraries. And it's very much worth um, watching her presentations on YouTube and reading her articles. She's demonstrated that while toxic work environments are terrible for all workers, BIPOC librarians experience abuse and neglect at far greater frequency um, and severity than do white librarians. If you read Tima Oaken's description of how white supremacy shows up in organizations, it clearly shows that white supremacy culture is toxic for everyone, but is especially harmful to our BIPOC colleagues. Elements like urgency, perfectionism, power hoarding, paternalism, and fear of open conflict keep all workers from feeling safe showing up at work as their authentic selves. And again, this is how the system was made to work because it keeps us isolated and anxious, grinding away as hard as we can so we don't have the time and space to view ourselves as exploited workers. If we keep our noses to the grindstone, we'll never see the barely visible strings on all workers that are being pulled by folks in power. So I'd like to believe that slow librarianship offers us a path toward healthy organizations and collective wellness. But our field wasn't the first to embrace the idea of slowing down. The slow movement actually started with slow food. The slow food movement was a response to the impact of globalization on food and came to prominence when members um, protested the opening of a McDonald's at the Spanish Steps in Rome. While it started in Italy, it became an international movement focused on enjoying food, 
appreciating terroir and local food culture, and ethically sourcing food. The three main tenets of the slow food movement are good, clean, and fair. And they relate mainly to social justice, sustainability, quality, and pleasure, which are excellent values to live by. Slow food is focused not just on personal choice and enjoyment, but on systemic change that protects local food systems and provides access to healthy quality food to all. The Slow Food Manifesto clearly spoke to many. Um, the idea of slow has now been adopted in areas as diverse as parenting, medicine, urban design, religion, teaching, and more. These ideas have pushed me to question so many of the assumptions I just long accepted as reality. And I'm grateful that our profession is starting to question these norms that really aren't serving the majority of us. I'd read about slow in other contexts, but it wasn't until I read Julia Glassman's article in 2017 that I thought about the idea of applying the concept of slow to our profession. Her article came right at the time um, I was having my own realizations about my work addiction, and that beautiful synchronicity really launched me on this slow journey. In her article, um, Glassman explicitly declined to describe what slow librarianship might look like in the profession, focusing more on defining the problems that necessitate a change. But I think this last sentence gives us a clue about what she was thinking. Perhaps if we reject the capitalist drive to constantly churn out new products and instead take a stand to support more reflective and responsive practices, we can offer our patrons services that are deeper, more lasting and more human. I really love that vision and it formed the basis for my own work. Based on Glassman's work and my own readings and reflections, here's my attempt at defining what slow librarianship might look like. Slow librarianship is an anti-racist, responsive and values-driven practice that stands in opposition to neoliberal values. Workers in slow libraries are focused on relationship building, deeply understanding and meeting patron needs and providing equitable services to their communities. Internally, slow library culture is focused on learning and reflection, collaboration and solidarity, valuing all kinds of contributions and supporting staff as whole people. Slow librarianship is a process, not a destination. It's an orientation toward our work, ourselves and others that creates positive change. And it's an organizational philosophy that supports workers and builds stronger relationships with our communities. I wanna be clear that the opposite of achievement culture isn't not caring about our work or embracing mediocrity or being lazy. The opposite of achievement culture is slowing down to think about why we are doing what we're doing so that we can do our best and most meaningful work. The opposite of achievement culture is not being driven by fear and scarcity or a desire for external recognition, and instead being driven by our values and by the needs of our patrons, as well as our own needs as human beings. Now I'll share my vision of the characteristics of slow librarianship. These aren't the be all end all, and I hope will spawn conversations about what slow librarianship might look like in your library or how it might impact your own orientation toward work. We're all working in different organizational cultures with different limitations and priorities. So librarianship isn't a one size fits all approach. It's a philosophy um, and, and an approach toward our work rather than something that's prescriptive. Like the definition of slow food movement broken up into good, clean, and fair, I broke the characteristics up into three categories, good, humane, or human, and thoughtful. And each has a list of characteristics related to it. I think for a library to be good, we first have to recognize where we've fallen short in the past and where we continue to fall short. Librarians who embrace slow will also embrace critical practice. Instead of accepting things because they've been that way forever, 
will question the assumptions and power structures that lie beneath them. Just like how many now see that vocational awe represents a power structure designed to remove our ability to advocate for and take care of ourselves, there's so many norms, assumptions, and power structures that harm our patrons and colleagues. I think we have to acknowledge the harm libraries have caused to marginalized communities um, and, and individuals. We can't really improve unless we recognize that libraries have not actually always been good for everyone. And then the next step, once we can sort of see behind the curtain, is to dismantle structures that oppress, that exclude, and that create inequity. And yet when you look at the efforts our profession has made to address these issues, they've almost uniquely done it through adding, not dismantling. Diversity residencies, scholarships, diversity statements. Those are great, but if that library's culture is still built on a white supremacist foundation, the library won't be a place that includes and values the perspectives of BIPOC library workers. Real dismantling is desperately needed. Um, Tima Oaken's white supremacy culture document can be a great starting off point for organizations that are looking to identify and dismantle white supremacy culture and practices in their own organizations. Here you can see the topics covered in an adapted version of her work that I also linked to in the bibliography. I'm sure you've seen some of these characteristics at your own institution. Um, I've not worked in a single library that um, doesn't exhibit at least some of these characteristics, if not all of them. They're so clearly tied to achievement culture, capitalism, and individualism that it's no surprise that we've all internalized them. I remember the first time I read this, I found it both helpful and incredibly disturbing to see how many of these I personally exemplified in my own work. And it's led me to try to um, let go of assumptions and combat behaviors um, in myself that contribute to white supremacy in my organization. We owe it to our BIPOC colleagues and patrons to do this work, but dismantling white supremacy can improve the quality of life for everyone in an organization. A good way to avoid a focus on innovation and visible wins is to ensure that your organization is led by its mission and values. Libraries often make decisions that are in direct opposition to stated values like privacy because they're driven by other unspoken values like wanting to provide the content patrons want. It's really important to surface and discuss those places of contradiction. And connecting around values can help staff see what they're really working for. When the library is doing any sort of planning, staff should weigh priorities based on how in line they are with the library's values. They should also weigh priorities based on a deep knowledge of the needs of their community. Libraries are not equitably serving their community if they're not laser focused on their most oppressed and needy members we should be judged by how we engage and serve those community members. This requires actually understanding their needs and wants, which is not just about assessment, but also relationship building in our communities and collaboration with other groups that serve these populations. Never has the need for human and humane organizations been more apparent than during the pandemic. The number of articles on burnout in our field over the past four years was almost triple what was published in the previous five. Something clearly has to change. A people first organization is one that cares about its people as people. You're more than what you contribute to your workplace and a good supervisor should care about your well being. A humane library would create an environment where all staff feel a sense of psychological safety. They don't have to hide parts of themselves, the fact that they're a caregiver, their chronic illness, their culture. People in a humane organization also feel supported in setting boundaries that maximize their well being. They don't feel pressured to stay late at work because the boss does, or to do more than others to make sure their job's secure. And I think it takes proactive communication from managers to create such an environment. 
Managers, if you're waiting for your employees to come and ask you for help, you're doing it wrong. I think one of the most powerful things I've done in recent years is just recognizing and honoring my finitude, my limitations, that I can't just keep doing more and more and more. Whether you're disabled or not, you only have so many spoons, so much energy and time to devote to everything in your life. Self-care is more than just spa days and buying stuff. It's resting, it's erecting healthy boundaries, it's self-compassion, it's creating space for ourselves so that we can focus on community care. Because when we're stressed and depleted, our ability to show up for others really suffers. We can't be truly compassionate toward others if we're not compassionate towards ourselves. But slow librarianship can't just be about us as individuals. We really have to focus on creating environments where everyone, regardless of their status in the organization, has the ability to prioritize their well being, not just faculty, not just professional librarians, everyone. Community care is the only sustainable way to ensure wellness for all. This obsession with productivity and producing is so short-sighted. We all know there's value in not spending every waking moment moving the needle forward on projects. The time that I spend talking to a colleague may not look like work, but it's often building capacity for collaboration, sharing knowledge, decreasing stress, or leading to a better work culture. Time spent visiting with other campus or community groups may not be directly related to a specific project, but it probably results in learning more about your community and how to serve it better. The more our relationships with colleagues and others in the community are transactional, the less likely they'll be to bear valuable fruit. Some of my best instructional collaborations with faculty in my liaison areas grew out of my just being around or from my attempts to build relationships without a specific goal in mind. But also spending time not working toward a specific goal is critical to our creativity and ultimately our productivity. I know when I feel like I have too much on my plate, my ability to do anything decreases. I feel like an overloaded computer where every program slows down and like buffering. <laughs> Research has shown that giving employees space and time is actually good for the bottom line. And people absolutely need fallow time and time talking to others to be creative. The cult of productivity speaks to that need we have to feel busy and therefore worthwhile. In America, being busy is a status symbol. If you're busy, well, gosh, you must be important. It's a way to cover our, up our existential, uh, existential worries, but ultimately it's just more treadmill walking. In Julia Glassman's article about innovation and slow librarianship, she talked about that arms race at her place of work to be the most innovative. It was a great example about how our current reward systems are really designed to reward individual genius rather than the teamwork that's needed to make most great projects happen. The current reward systems, both within our libraries and in our library organizations, provide incentives for people not to work in teams, or if they are in teams, to focus on make making sure that they stand out. We know that most big things in libraries aren't done by a single person, yet most awards are designed to recognize an individual. We need to change those systems to reward being a great team member, um, to reward those who help others to shine. This will help prevent toxic cultures where people feel in competition with each other. Also, we need to not only reward the creation of hot new things, but the maintenance and improvement of existing valued services. I truly believe the most important change we can make is to be in solidarity with our fellow workers. This requires us to focus less on ourselves and our desire to shine, rise, or receive external recognition, and to focus more on efforts to see everyone in our community rise. What would a thoughtful contemplative organization look like? 
When we're single-mindedly focused on finishing a project, we can miss out on really valuable collaborative learning and team building that come from taking time and creating a truly collaborative and humane process that leads to a valuable reflection and learning. But you can't value process over product if you're afraid of failure or you feel a sense of urgency from the people above you. This also speaks to my next point about a learning culture. To me, a learning culture means a space where workers want to know more about their patrons' needs and how they use the library, where workers are actually given time and funding to learn, and where the organization comes together to learn and reflect collaboratively. Time is the most important piece in all of this. We simply can't grow if we're too busy to reflect on what we're doing. When we're overwhelmed, we tend to be reactive and run on autopilot most of the time. And when you're constantly pressured to add new things, of course you're not gonna have time to learn and reflect. What's the likelihood of us making really good decisions if we never have time to slow down? I spoke before about how our current recognition and reward systems are designed to recognize the individual, but also I find that our field is surprisingly stingy with recognition of any kind. And all that does is create scarcity and that competition mentality. Recognition is one of the very few resources we have that is endlessly renewable. People don't necessarily need money or a plaque. Sometimes just calling out people's contributions in a meeting or sending them an appreciative email can make all the difference. And when you feel appreciated, your motivation increases. I truly believe that a culture of appreciation can lead to a shift in people's mindsets for the better. Managers and administrators have a lot of power to change so much of this. A lot of slow librarianship requires systemic change creating a definition of what enough looks like, incentivizing workers to work collaboratively, providing time for learning, reflection, and relationship building, changing expectations about productivity, focusing more on quality than quantity, and letting the go of the idea that doing a lot means doing good, drawing a line in the sand and saying, we can't do more without more people and funding. If you're a manager, what are you doing to create a culture like this for your employees? There are also changes we can make to our own mindsets to really embrace and reap the benefits of slowness. These days, it's rare that a day goes by when I'm not in pain, yet I feel more well than at any other point in my life. And a lot of that came from changes in my thinking and how I live my life. I am still not a gratitude journaling, morning routine, having your best life now person by any stretch. But I do believe that letting go of a lot of our capitalist programming can help us to lead happier and healthier lives. Having a chronic illness um, is a really great lesson in how little control we actually have over anything in our lives. My body calls the shots these days, and I have the choice of either being okay with my day being upended by my illness or trying to muscle through and becoming even more ill. And trust me, I spent plenty of time in the past suffering because I did the latter. You don't need a lesson like that to recognize the toxic nature of control and loosen your grip on things. So many of us go through life white knuckling everything, holding on so hard out of fear. Here's a workplace example. Um, one of my strengths is project management. So I used to lead a lot of projects in the library. Even with projects where lots of people were responsible for different deliverables, I still felt like I was responsible for the work of my peers. I felt like I basically needed to helicopter mom my colleagues to get stuff done. And doing that made me very frustrated and stressed and resentful. So as I started to embrace slow, I asked myself, what would happen if I just stopped doing that? The result wasn't actually that bad. Yes, some things did not get done on time, but surprisingly, the world didn't end and I felt a whole lot less stressed and miserable. It can be such a powerful thing to ease up on the reins a bit, to stop operating from a place of fear. Feeling responsible for everything is a recipe for burnout. As I mentioned earlier, there's so much manufactured scarcity in our profession 
that it's no surprise that many of us grind away and focus on our own self-preservation. Whether you work in precarity or just feel like there's not enough praise, raises, promotions, or safety to go around at work, it's really easy to start seeing your colleagues as competition. And it obviously benefits administrators for us to see things that way because it makes us work harder. In recent years, I've gotten really involved in my union, and it's been deeply inspiring to see what can happen when people really come together to fight for our collective welfare. We won massive gains in our contract this year. But to do that, we had to be willing to obviously to let go of whatever meager gains we could gain over our colleagues if we went it alone. I love this quote from Anne Helen Peterson in her essay about why white collar workers didn't unionize. How would your office culture shift if you actually thought of yourself in solidarity with your coworkers and together advocating for greater resources instead of in competition for, with them for the few resources allocated to you? How would your conception of yourself shift if you felt empowered, not by your hopes for eventual advancement, but by identification with others? While we should absolutely fight to rid our workplaces of precarious employment and manufactured scarcity, we can also individually choose to adopt an abundance mindset and reject the scarcity narratives that constantly come our way. I really think it's important to disentangle ourselves from this individualistic culture. I know I feel much better when my focus is on collective action. Back in 2020, I was listening to the wonderful podcast, Everything Happens, when the host, Kate Bowler, a professor at Duke Divinity School living with cancer, asked, am I built from the outside in or am I built from the inside out? I found that question really provocative. How much of our visions of su what success would be for us based on external measures of success or the desire for external validation? I used to be on the path toward becoming a library director. I was climbing the ladder. And I realized one day that it just wasn't what I wanted to do. I love teaching and working directly with students. I love being part of a union. I love the work I do and not wanting to move up doesn't make me unambitious. A big part of finding your own path is not comparing yourself to others. It's poison. Until that time, I really hadn't considered what it would mean if I was enough right now, right in this moment. And that honestly changed everything for me. What if you are good enough as you are today? What if you didn't need to keep proving yourself? How might that change your priorities? I think many of us are already uneasy um, about our relationships with online technologies, whether it's the time we spend on them, the fragmented state of our attention, or how that makes us they make us feel. Social media and email are massive time sucks these days, but they're not the only things keeping us from being able to notice and reflect. When you feel like you're not enough, you can end up in a trance, just so focused on how you're perceived, so anxiously striving to be better that you can't see all the good things around you. You can't reflect and grow. It's only when you get, whoops, sorry about that. It's only when you get out of um, that trance that you can really pay attention. I found that the quality of my attention has improved massively since I started to see myself as enough. Mindfulness doesn't have to mean meditation. Really the most important thing I've gotten out of my own mindfulness practice is just a habit of slowing down, noticing how I'm feeling in the moment and looking at what's happening around me. Before I often felt held hostage by my anxiety, but now I'm comfortable sitting with my discomfort and really considering what's causing it. Mindfulness is really just about paying attention. It's incredible how much of our lives we spend on autopilot and reacting rather than really reflecting on what's happening. Mindfulness has helped me feel more in control of my emotions and not stuck in that habit of self-blame. It's helped me become more critically reflective. I feel like I have access to like so much more that was always around me, but I didn't notice it. There's so much beauty in the world. Who wants to be numb to all of that? So my advice is pay attention to what you pay attention to. Decide if those things are worth your time. 
Find ways to take control of your attention and use it in ways that enrich your life, not limit it. We don't actually have to have our email or Slack open all day. <laughs> we, we don't need to respond instantly to everything and have our attention yanked around. We're complicit in reproducing the expectations around response times and availability by continuing to adhere to them. So many of us have little control over the culture of our workplaces, but that doesn't mean we have to give in to the prevailing culture. There's nothing natural or inevitable about how time currently works in the workplace. The exhausting pace, the choice to never subtract, only add, the inability to ever define what enough would look like. We can't wait for our dysfunctional workplaces to change. We have to decide who we want to be and how we can model that in our work. Sometimes we have to resist the dominant culture. Sometimes we have to say no. I do pick my battles better now, but I've also determined what my most strongly held values are and I let those guide me. My hope is that modeling slow librarianship in my own behavior can create small changes in the culture. Maybe it will help others come to the re realization that another way is possible. I truly believe that slowing down has made me a better librarian, a better colleague, and a healthier me. The most important thing to remember is that it takes just one tiny imperfect step forward to begin moving ourselves towards slowness. It doesn't need to be massive radical change, and it's totally normal to backslide on your journey. I do all the time. But when you take that small step forward, you're joining a community of library workers who believe that a better, healthier future is possible. Thank you so much for listening. You can find my slides at the link below, which also includes my bibliography. Um, but for now, I'd love to hear your questions or thoughts. My work is constantly evolving and has really benefited from hearing and discussing um, these ideas with others. Sorry. All right, thank you so mu much, Meredith. That was amazing. Thank um, you. Yeah. So I, I just want to draw folks' attention in the audience to the Q&A feature in Zoom. We've got a couple questions so far, but please do uh, type away. We want to make sure that you get your questions answered. And I'm, I know Meredith is interested in your questions. Yeah. So I'm happy to, to read these, Meredith, if, if that's helpful and, and you can reply. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you. Okay, great. So yeah, the first question that came in, um, I'll just read it verbatim. Advice for middle managers, when scarcity, white supremacy culture rules above, but want to create more humane experience for people below in the organizational chart. I've definitely been in that situation. Um, that's actually probably why I'm not a manager anymore. It's really hard to be put in a position where our role as managers is to support our employees, but the people above us are creating a culture where where we are not being, you know, actually supported in doing that work or act actively hampered. And I think sometimes that means going against the grain and doing, making, you know, really modeling a different way of being a manager. Um, I think that's, that's really critical. I mean, and honestly, that may put you in the crosshairs of the people above you. Um, but, you know, like if you're, um, if the structures in your library are designed to really just, um, to just reward like individual achievement and, and create like that sort of scarcity, like, I think you need to advocate with the people above you to change those things. A lot of libraries now are starting to look at the, the structures that exist. I see so many libraries now realizing that like the whole search process is actually built on a white supremacist and ableist foundation. And so many now are changing the way that they do that. So I think maybe showing examples from other libraries that have dismantled some of these structures that really harm people can be valuable. Um, but yeah, I know what it's like to um, go against the grain. I know how incredibly painful and hard it can be. But I mean, 
I don't know. I, I just think it, it feels a lot better to be on the side of the people who report to us than to be on the side of people who are causing harm. Yeah, and, and I, I guess I would point out um, back to your slides, the being unionized, I'm sure has its levers, right? I mean, that's a game yes. changer, I would guess. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Now working in a union environment is very different from from um, when I was a manager and uh, was not working, was not represented by the union. It's very nice to have to be able to stand together with people and fight for the things that you want to see change. Great. OK, well, well, next up is is a compliment. So uh, that was beautiful. And I want to thank you for such a meaningful presentation. So I didn't want to not uh -huh. technically a question, but we will allow it because it's nice. So thank How you. How dare you? <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. OK, so the next one is a question. Uh, do you have any mantras or self reminders that help you resist productivity culture? Uh, things that would keep you calm when you choose to slow down? Hmm. Yeah. I mean, for me, it's really like, I tell myself to stop all the time. Like I used to be really like reactive and I felt like I had to answer everything very quickly. Like I, I felt like, oh, if somebody asks me to be on a committee, I need to let them know fast. Like I, and now I sit on the email and I take my time and I picture like, what would it be like doing this? Cause a lot of times we say, yes to things because they're kind of far away and we don't think about what it'll be like. But I often, um, <laughs> I often say to myself, like, if, if I had to do this thing tomorrow, how would I feel about it? <laughs> and that often really changes the calculus for me. So, yeah, I mean, my, the only thing I constantly tell myself is stop and slow down. Um, cause I'm definitely, um, you know, I, I had some childhood trauma and so I'm a very like reactive person. I, my, I have a hard time regulating my emotions. So like just telling myself to stop all the time is like the most important thing personally for me. And then it gives me time to like, say like, is what I'm feeling valid um, and real? Like is uh, like, you know, the, Thing that I'm feeling hurt and mad about like is this something based on like what the person actually did or am I like responding to something else in my life so yeah just slow down <laughs> yeah that's really good advice I, th I think that idea that you said of visualizing the reality like what does it mean like to be on this committee someone wants yeah. me to present with them or write a paper like what does that look like and what are the sacrifices you might have to make uh, yeah. We just get past that so often. Yeah, for sure. Okay, great. Well, the questions are coming in. I'll try to keep up. Um, okay, you mentioned not wanting to go into leadership, but that often comes with a pay raise and is sometimes the only way a pay increase can happen aside from leaving. What can we as librarians do about this? I don't think there's anything wrong with going into a leadership role. Um that's definitely not not what I'm what I'm suggesting. Um, I think if that's a path that you are interested in and passionate about, go for it. Like I, but yeah, I think at a lot of places, the way to get to you know get more make more money is to move up. I'm lucky um, to be in a faculty position at a community college where we have a we have step raises every year. Um, and, you know, we do get, we do get very healthy um, bonuses, um, not bonuses, healthy raises every year. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think you, you make choices in life and I know I could make more money as a library director, a lot more than I would ever make in my role, but I don't want to, like, I don't want that role. I don't think I'd be happy in that role. I don't think it's a good fit for me. And it's not worth a lot of money for me to be miserable is sort of how I see it. And obviously that's easy to say if you're in a position where you can pay for everything in your life. And for others, you may have to make different decisions. And 
sometimes that does mean leaving um, a job for a, a better paying job if you can't move up in your organization. I mean, that's just the reality. All right. Um... The next question, how do you propose sharing this information with your library colleagues when a toxic culture of achievement is so prevalent? Thinking about doing this work sounds so exhausting already because I know I will receive pushback, but I know it will be so good for my colleagues to receive and reflect on. I think, you know, it's always worth sharing this with colleagues. I, I work with a lot of like I would describe them as super women. Like they have definitely um, drunk the um, vocational awe Kool Aid, and let, as many of us have, and they are very more than happy to sacrifice their well being for um, our students, and that's lovely. That's lovely, but like they deserve, they deserve to also be able to prioritize their families and their lives and all of that. Um, so, you know, I, I try to encourage my colleagues to set boundaries. Many of them don't. Um, I know for me, I, I work, I overworked for a really long time until I had my own realization. And some people are not going to, to, you know, take to this until they have their own realization, maybe something in their life, they become a caregiver or they have a serious illness or they just get so burnt out that they can't do it anymore. Um, but yeah, you can't force people to embrace this stuff. So I think sometimes just um, modeling it in your own behavior, like my colleagues saw me as a, a major overworking vocational awe sort of person and now they see me as someone who sets healthy boundaries. And I hope that when some of my colleagues are more ready to set healthy boundaries themselves, they see that they have a colleague who cares about them and is happy to show them the way. But yeah, you can't, you certainly can't force it. Yeah, and, and I'll just note it, so much of what uh, you're saying and, and tying it back to the original slow food movement, you know, um, at the Spanish steps. I mean, so much yeah. of European culture, for example, it's already built in this idea of work-life balance and you're more than your job and, and really the dignity of all jobs. Like, you know, yeah. you'll, you'll see a career waiter, you know, he's done it or she's done it for, you know, 35 years. And it's, it's got all this dignity to it where here it's seen as a service job that maybe you, you do that to pay your college tuition. So it is interesting to get out um, and experience other cultures and realize that, a lot of what we have here, the Protestant work ethic, et cetera, is very U.S. specific. <laughs> and so, um, yeah. Yeah, for sure. Okay, well, I didn't mean to, didn't mean to take our time. Uh, the yeah. next one is one of the hardest parts of this is to feel that I'm enough. Thank you so much for that reminder. How do you keep that always in mind? It's hard. <laughs> it's very hard. We have our programming telling us that that we're not enough all the time. Um, but for me, um, it's just through it's, yeah, it's just constantly reminding myself, like if I, if I start to feel like, oh, I'm not doing enough at work, I just have to, again, slow down and ask myself, is that really true? Am I not doing enough at work? Or am I just kind of feeling that old anxiety that I'm never doing enough? I mean, I used to like, work was like my hobby at home, work was everything. And I still didn't feel like I was doing enough. So I kind of try to remind myself of that time in my life and say like, is this real? Like this feeling that that I'm not enough or, or, or doing enough or whatever in this situation, or is it just the old feeling? You know, is it the old feelings coming back? Cause rarely, I don't think there's ever been a moment where I've been like, yeah, really? Yeah, I really am not doing enough. Like I really should be doing doing more. So yeah, I, I constantly have to remind myself of that because we always go back to our old programming. Okay. Well, we are right at noon. We have uh, maybe two unanswered questions. So I'll, I'll defer to Meredith. Do, do you want to go a little overtime uh, into the lunch break or, or would you rather maybe respond to these offline? I, I'm happy to keep going if folks are okay with it. Okay. 
Yeah, it's it's not back to back with another session. So oh, yeah, awesome. if folks, if folks don't mind, uh, it does feel like a slight violation here of infringing on your lunchtime. So make your own choice. Be smart. Yeah. Be wise. Yeah, take to your people. lunch break. Take your lunch break. But if you want to stay and visualize what it'll be like to be hungry. Okay. Um. Yeah. So the next to last questions. Let's see. How can a manager help senior staff dial back and slow down? I have a staff member who will not allow anyone to help them no matter how far behind they fall with their work. They rush through tasks and are constantly stressed out and snap at everyone else constantly. There'd be more to this than we think. They always patrol everyone else's work and complain about how everyone does their job, good or bad. I don't know how to help this individual and think they would greatly benefit from slowing down and shutting off the competitiveness. Are there any trainings or professional development that you would recommend? That's a good question. I don't know when somebody is is really like, and and that I'm the only one sort of mentality is very much um, very much a part of um, white supremacy culture, and it was one that I very much recognized in myself back in the day, like I thought, oh my God, if if I'm not here, everything's gonna fall apart. Surprisingly, that has not happened. And I went on sabbatical recently and surprisingly, everything is still standing at my library. Amazing. Um, I, think, I think if you have the ability to, to maybe ask this person some, some reflective questions, like why do they, what makes them think they're the only person who can do this work? What makes that, why do they feel like they're holding everything on their shoulders? Like, I think it wasn't until I started to ask myself those sorts of questions that I realized, oh yeah, they're not, it's not true. I mean, it's, it, it's something I think to make us feel like we're important, like, we have value and I would ask that person, maybe do they feel valuable and valued in the organization? Maybe there's some reason that they don't that would make them maybe let go of the reins a little bit. But I, you know, like I said, somebody who is really like stuck in that mentality, it can be hard. Um, for me, it was really, um, reading and uh, listening to the work of Jenny O'Dell, um, who wrote the book, How to Do Nothing. Um, I had listened to a talk that she gave that actually was what led to her book deal for How to Do Nothing and uh, back in like 2019. And it just, I don't know, it just blew my mind and like got me thinking so differently about just this like constant need to be productive and like productive productivity towards what for what purpose um so hopefully you know maybe by asking some leading questions you can get them thinking about this at least yeah there's this uh there's this charles de gaulle quote um i think it's um how does it go the graveyard is filled with indispensable men right yes. so it's this idea that the world will, you need me. It's, if it's not me, who? And it's like, well, eventually you'll be gone and we'll, we're all gonna, we're all gonna be okay. So, all right, last question. And thanks for those uh, folks staying over time. Do you have any suggestions for starting points for reestablishing these types of boundaries at work, especially in a toxic work environment uh, you are able to leave? Not, a, not able to leave, yeah. Oh, sorry, that you're not able the to addition. leave. Yeah. yeah, yeah, so, um... Yeah, I mean, it's hard, right? When, especially if you're in an environment where setting boundaries is going to lead to maybe you having fewer opportunities for raises or promotions. If you're in working in precarity, it probably isn't even that possible to slow down as an individual. And that's why I think, um, you know, collective action is so important. But for me, I mean, it was just really just saying to myself, do I need to be doing all of these things? Um, you know, just questioning why I was on so many committees. Like, like was there were some that I was just on 
because they were prestigious, not because like there was anything I was specifically contributing to them that was so valuable. Like I just thought, oh, this is something where administrators are going to see me doing this and I'm going to look good. Um, so for me, it was just starting to be driven by like, instead of by being trying to be noticed by my values and what was most important what what was the work that was most important to me? Um, so a lot of my work now is really focused on things that directly impact my students, things. Um, uh, I spend a lot of time building relationships with faculty, a lot more time than I used to in my liaison areas with the goal of building better instructional collaborations in classes. Um, yeah, it's it's hard. I can't say like, there's a one size fits all approach because obviously if you're at a place where you get merit raises and you need that money, you're still going to have to make decisions that, you know, will lead you to get those, those raises. But I think, yeah, yes, my library is pretty amazing, Nia. I, it's, it's really nice just to not, I have tenure, I don't have to, you know, I'm in a really privileged position and I recognize that. Um, but I think, you know, all of those things obviously came from our union and from fighting for um, for what we needed. We actually um, just basically with our last um, union push, we made our part-time faculty not really at will anymore. They have to, they can only be, like not get teaching assignments anymore with cause. There has to be a cause. So like, that's massive. That's so unusual at um, any sort of institution. You know, usually part-time faculty are the most precarious and can just be gotten rid of on a whim. Um, so I think, you know, if you don't have a union, finding collective ways that you can fight together to change some of the norms so that you can all slow down and and focus more on the things that are most meaningful to our patrons rather than whatever looks most innovative to your boss, like chasing, you know, oh, my boss is really into assessment. And so I'm going to focus on that. Like what is actually going to be most meaningful to our patrons? I, you know, if we work together, I think we can try to change these norms. All right. Well, well, thank you so much, Meredith. This was great. And I know everyone, um, everyone feels the same. I've been seeing all the positive comments. So thank you so much for doing this for us and, um, and for leaving your contact information here for folks that want to follow up and, and learn yeah. more. Yeah. Thanks for having me, everyone. Have a great day.